And now, Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. During Women's History Month, we celebrate and we honor the women who made history throughout history, who saw what could be unburdened by what had been. This has been Veep Thoughts by Kamala Harris. Stewdoesmerch.com is the place to go. Use promo code STU10 to save 10% on maybe your Andrew Cuomo is awful mug, which may pop up in the show today. If you're watching on YouTube, like this video right now. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Do all the good things podcast listeners and viewers do. Janestine is going to be here with some great stories of people beating the odds and maybe a little talk about Andrew Cuomo. A Florida state representative fell victim to a little bit of trolling because, you know, we're all apparently 12-year-old boys on the inside. But we start by doing the awakening of the New York Times. I mean, the news has kind of sucked lately, hasn't it? It's been kind of a downer. I've been bummed out by the world lately. And I thought maybe today we could bring you some actual good news. Janice Dean is always there for you on that front. But let me start here by something that you might not have heard of. And and I'm, I'm not saying... The media is changing. I'm not saying they're getting better. What I'm saying is occasionally there are moments that you can look at and say, hey, this isn't so incredibly terrible. And when that happens, we should highlight them because they are few and they are far between. We know what happens with Republican presidential candidates. When a Republican presidential candidate rises to the top, we start seeing the media go crazy. Everyone is worse than the one before. I mean, Ronald Reagan looked like he was the ultimate uh, person of all-time evil until George W. Bush showed up. Then he was a terrorist. He was the worst. Cheney, the worst guy ever. And then it was Giuliani was like the worst guy ever. And, and then it was Mitt Romney. I mean, you remember what they did with Mitt Romney? I mean, he, look, you say what you will about Mitt Romney, but like he's like the most boring guy in the world. Like, I mean, he, you can't even tell. Does he have any positions? I don't even know. And then what do they do? They attacked his personal character. Even if you don't like his policies, you think the guy's, at the very least, not scandal-ridden, right? Well, then the media got a hold of him. Remember Mitt Romney's binders full of women? Yes, he, he was trying to hire women. He was basically doing what the left wants you to do when it comes to gender. He's, just, he's eliminating half the population and picking his employees from binders full of women. And that became a scandal as if he had actually trapped real women inside of binders. It was just their resumes, guys. But that didn't matter. Of course, he did trap real dogs on his roof. We all remember that. Yes, Mitt Romney drove to Canada with his do- with a dog on his roof. And if you think that stuff has died off, well, no, no. Now we have, uh, of course, we know what they did to Donald Trump. We now have Ron DeSantis in the fold. And what's the new scandal with Ron DeSantis? Ron DeSantis ate chocolate pudding with three fingers. Now, it's important to note that Ron DeSantis is denying that he ate chocolate pudding with three fingers. But let me just say, I completely defend him on this point. Chocolate pudding is delicious. Would you like to eat it with a spoon? Sure. That would be great. Is there a spoon around? Sure, I'll eat it with a spoon. Is there not a spoon around? No? Well, what am I going to do with it? It's not going to stay in the bowl. That's not going to happen. I'm going to get it out of there somehow. And you know, three, kind of scoop, make your three fingers into a scoop, scoop it up. I, look, this might be the best part of a future Ron DeSantis presidency. Uh, I'm just saying right now. I'm calling it right now. But the New York Times did not just, uh, what are they going to do with Ron DeSantis? They're going to attack him. What are they going to do with Donald Trump? They're going to attack him. In fact, every Republican president, they're always going to attack, right? That's just how they do it. Well, this week, they decided to tweak this formula just a little bit. And it's, uh, it's sort of a fascinating result. Let me give you the preview here of a real video. This is not me making it up. This is a real video from the New York Times. These are his socks. This is his hand. 
He quit drinking at 40. Now he likes the pain. But that's not why we're telling you about this guy. We're telling you about him because he did one of the best things that anyone has ever done. At least in the last 20 years. So what did he do? He saved 25 million lives around the world. Yep, you heard that right. 25 million. That would be like saving every Australian. And here's a catch. You already know him. You might not even like him. So, who is he? Yeah, that guy saved 25 million lives. Who is that guy? Well, if you're a podcast listener, you don't know yet, but you're about to. In this story, George W. Bush is the hero. That is the headline of a video from the New York Times. And it's an opinion piece by Nicholas Kristof, who, if you don't know who Nicholas Kristof is, uh, not a fan of the Bush administration, was a big critic of Bush the entire time. Uh, and the video goes on and on about this relationship between Nicholas Kristof and uh, George W. Bush and how he was very critical of Bush uh, for a lot of the things he did. To give you kind of a, a resume on that criticism, here is Nicholas Kristof. The Iraq war was a catastrophe. I opposed it. I hammered Bush for it. But it's time for us to acknowledge another truth about his legacy, even if it's uncomfortable for us liberals. Bush also authored the single best policy of any president in my lifetime. And most Americans don't even know about it. The single best policy of any president in his lifetime. And he's not a young guy. That's kind of amazing that the New York Times would even allow that on their website. And it's a fascinating study on where the media is. Because first of all, you get the tone of this video, which is like, it's basically intended to be completely shocking, as if George W. Bush could not possibly have passed a positive uh, policy, anything that actually helped people. He was Satan, after all. And it's kind of in, it's written and produced in a way to challenge liberals, right, to say, hey, uh, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of trolling liberals in a way. Basically, hey, uh, yeah, we're saying this. George W. Bush actually did something right. Now, that might you know, not be exactly stunning to a lot of people. What policy, though, are they talking about that is this impressive? The greatest policy achievement by any president in our lifetimes? What is it? Just a few weeks before Iraq, Bush also launched PEPFAR, a global program to fight AIDS. Seldom has history offered a greater opportunity to do so much for so many. Tonight I propose the emergency plan for AIDS relief, a work of mercy beyond all current international efforts to help the people of Africa. Now, you might remember that policy. If you're a conservative media person, person who listens to talk show, uh, talk radio a lot, you, you might remember this policy. George W. Bush did PEPFAR. It was uh, very, very popular. In fact, he was praised. You could go to Africa and see street names uh, af uh, named after George W. Bush. He was a guy that was really revered there because particularly of this policy. As the New York Times notes, the estimates are that it saved 25 million lives. Now you might say, okay, well, of course they're praising this one policy from Bush because, I mean, it's, you know, it's sort of a liberal policy construct, right? Where you, ha you have a bunch of, you know, have a rich country that has a bunch of resources that sees a problem around the world. It steps in, it helps out, it saves a lot of lives. Now, of course, if a democratic president did this, you might say, at the very least, it would not be done as competently and probably wouldn't have saved as many lives. And of course, you can throw a lot of resources and help other countries. We've got a lot of problems here. You know, that there, there's plenty to criticize about the general construct of this. But there is a hole here, too, for this type of policy, I believe, which is when you can do an incredible amount for a low, low, a low, low bargain price and help a lot of people for, you know, without tons and tons of resources, it's a pretty tempting thing to do. Now, as a person who doesn't really like government spending, I would love for this to be done outside of the government. But I think we can all kind of recognize that there are things that we can do that can really help people in other countries. And, you know, many times that's done by American charity. I'd also point you to Bjorn Lomborg. We talked about him yesterday. His Copenhagen Consensus Center, which does a really good job of saying, OK, here are the big problems in the world. How far can we get a dollar to go? 
uh, you know, and they go and they will say, okay, in this, for global warming, $1 might do 18 cents worth of good. For malaria, getting malaria nets to help people in, you know, in Africa, $1 might do $40 worth of good. So maybe we should focus on that before we focus on controlling the temperature. A, and this is a crazy concept for people in Washington, a cost benefit analysis. And Bush correctly noted that these were really solvable problems in Africa. This didn't need to go on, and they were able to do a lot of good there. Um, you know, and, and it's funny because, of course, conservatives at the time talked about this policy. Conservatives at the time said this was a really good policy and he had done a really good job with this. And it wasn't just him, of course, it was Congress as well. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people who volunteered their time, a lot of charity went into this as well. A lot of people doing a lot of hard work on the ground went into this. But it really did stem the tide of an epidemic uh, at that time. It was really, really out of control. And there were some people uh, on the left or in the mainstream or even pop culture that did point this out uh, at the time. Uh, the New York Times highlights one of them. So why do so few Americans know about any of this? Unless you go to a U2 concert. I want to thank President Bush and Laura Bush for leading that effort, for creating that effort. But give it up to them. Working together, there's nothing we cannot accomplish if we are what? One. <laughs> I remember going to a U2 concert and he did that speech in front of the crowd and I, everyone was very confused. I, I will say, because it was earlier on and it was like the time you were not allowed to, a liberal audience was not supposed to clap for George W. Bush and he basically harangued them into doing it. I thought there was going to be a large boo when he said George and Laura Bush and, and actually people cheered. They said, hey, you know, hey, we can look at someone we might not even agree with politically and say, hey. He, maybe maybe this, these people aren't evil. Maybe uh, they did something really important and we can recognize it. Um, now, of course, you might note here, as someone who's a little skeptical of the media and the New York Times, that this is approximately two decades after it mattered, right? When this was going on, they all treated him as Satan. And then he leaves office and 20 years later, they're saying, hey, by the way, we missed this thing that saved 25 million lives. Oopsie. And you would have a really good point. It is incredibly true that all of that is accurate. Uh, they did not really say anything about this for a very long time, unless your name happened to be Bono. Um, and, you know, the New York Times didn't really do a good job covering this. The left certainly didn't give credit to George W. Bush about it. Now, uh, Nicholas Kristof does sort of address that in the video, talking about how he covered George W. Bush, and it wasn't praising him for 25 million people saved. Looking back, I've got my regrets. I complained constantly that the Bush administration was too focused on abstinence. Yeah, that was true. But I missed the fundamental truth that Bush was turning the tide of one of the deadliest epidemics in history. I also worry that because we didn't give Bush credit, we didn't incentivize other presidents to take on bold projects like this. Mm, yeah. So, I mean, first of all, uh, I, w I should uh, I was very right on the fact that I told people that were you know young not to just have sex. Uh, you know, maybe that was a, a solution. By the way, a hundred percent solution to AIDS. Uh, if you don't have uh, sex, well, ninety nine percent. I guess there's blood transfusions, but I think those are pretty much in the past. Uh, look, you can uh, of course. Uh, I, I like the fact that he pointed out that uh, he was focused on maybe the wrong things and kind of skipped over. Uh, this it's important to acknowledge when you make mistakes like this but he's correct in that like if you do it you know this happened um one of the examples of this more recently was uh again from more of a liberal perspective uh donald trump doing the reform of uh, criminal justice uh you know you did see people like kim kardashian for example come out and give him credit for that and you know that was one of my worries of the trump administration frankly that he would get you know kind of he liked talking to celebrities. He likes getting credit from celebrities. He likes getting credit for lots of stuff. And if if the left would have come to him with a different tone, not day one he's in office, they're protesting in the streets, calling him, uh, you know, uh, Hitler, instead had gone to him and say, hey, like, there's a lot of stuff we probably agree on. Let's see if we can get some stuff done. He may have gone, he liked some of those policies, at least at one point in his life. He may have gone along with some of them. Instead, they went the other way. And it is true. If you go and, and you say, if you're, you know, it's that, it's that standard sort of piece of advice. It's amazing the things you can accomplish when you don't care who gets the credit. 
And, you know, if back then they said, hey, they gave enormous credit to George W. Bush, he probably would have been more likely to do these types of policies that they agreed on. This one worked out really, really well, but not every piece of legislation that includes spending a lot of money to help people in other parts of the world works out so well. You know, it's easy to oppose them. Now, I think there is another thing to note beyond the fact that it's just been 20 years uh, since this went on as to why they're giving him credit. George W. Bush isn't like a regular Republican anymore, right? They waited until George W. Bush became a figure that, honestly, the base doesn't even like. I mean, there's very little uh, passion in the conservative movement at this point to defend anything that George W. Bush did. I think at times that gets a little overblown. I don't think he was the worst president of all time, but he did make mistakes. And that's really been the focus of the right at this point. So, you know, you look at it, the cynical way of looking at this, of course, is they waited 20 years. They waited till he's out of power. He's now just like painting and, and uh, you, know, you know, working on a ranch. And now he's not even liked by the base. So you can safely say he was one of the good ones, right? George W. Bush was one of the good ones. Oh, the old days, we, he was a great one. I don't know. We just don't have him like that anymore. Now they're all like Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis. They're all mean and evil and bad. Uh, back then, we liked George W. Bush. Now, if you were there in this period, as I was, you remember they literally despised this person. They hated him more than any person has ever been hated until Donald Trump showed up on the scene. So, I mean, it's honestly, there, there is some BS here and it's hard to wash that out. But still, I think it's important to take a minute when the New York Times actually acknowledges that a Republican did something that was successful and, and good and, and shine some light on it. Um, you know, uh, the, the New York Times is looking at this and saying, oh, my gosh, our readers are going to hate us. They're going to hate us because we actually are giving credit to George W. Bush for something. Uh, but Nicholas Kristof addresses that here at the end of the piece. Listen, you don't have to like George W. Bush, but let's be honest about history and let's accept the truth and people are complicated. When we ignore something so momentous, we're not sticking it to Bush, but to history and to truth. Mm. I mean, there's so many. First of all, that's totally true. Agree with him 100 percent on that. And you see, you see like another good example of this. And we will see a video in, I don't know, 20 years about this probably is, you know, peace in the Middle East. Right. Everything that went on with Israel in the Middle East, something that president after president after president had been done. It took all the way to get to Donald Trump and Jared Kushner to make sure um, that that whole situation had changed. And despite the fact that it was a universally agreed upon good until Trump got into office, he never really got any credit for that. And it's something that I think was a real, real shame and eventually probably will be recognized. This is something that we can learn to, from as well. It's, it's important to not just shoot down every idea just because it's coming from someone on the left. You know, uh, we're talking to Janice Dean here in a minute. One of the most important people in the, uh, the downfall of Andrew Cuomo and him being held accountable was a Democrat. We'll tell you his story here in a couple of minutes. But like, it's important when, when a Democrat does something great, we should all stand up and go, yeah, great job. Good job. We, may agree, we might disagree with you on a hundred other things, but yes, great job. Let's do more of that. Let's do that. We can do that together. That's good stuff. Let's do that together. Uh, that stuff does exist. Finding it at times can be difficult, but the media should recognize this about themselves. They should note that they keep making mistakes just like this don't do the I'm sorry video 20 years later. Just next time, try to change and do it right in the moment. Have you been given bad advice about your retirement savings? I mean, I thought those, uh, I thought the, you know, those collectible dolls, uh, they just looked like the best investment. And now all of a sudden no one cares about them. Um, this has happened to a lot of people. Were you told to, let's say, max out your 401k? Well, uh, you know, the Wall Street casino loves to roll the, the dice uh, with your hard earned savings. And like a casino, the house always wins. You might do well over time, but what about when you really need that money? Are you in the middle of a market downturn? The economy feels really, really off right now, doesn't it? There's a better way to grow your nest egg. Bank on yourself is a guaranteed and predictable retirement plan alternative that gives you 100% control of your money, plus tax-free income in retirement. There's no luck, there's no skill, there's no guesswork required. Your plan doesn't go backward when the markets tumble. This is really important, especially as we look forward right now. Both your principal and your growth are locked in. 
Wouldn't it be nice to be protected from that tax tsunami in retirement? Bank on yourself is the strategy that famous businesses like McDonald's used when no banker would lend them a dime, and almost anyone can do it. This is built-in inflation protection and ultimate peace of mind for your retirement. You can get a free report with all the details on how the bank on yourself strategy adds guarantees, predictability, tax savings, and control to your financial plan. Go to bankonyourself.com slash stew, bankonyourself.com slash stew. Check it out now, bankonyourself.com slash stew. I'm joined now by Janice Dean. She's a senior meteorologist at Fox News, of course, host of the Janice Dean podcast, which you should absolutely be subscribed to, and author of I Am the Storm, inspiring stories of people who fight against overwhelming odds. Be sure to grab a copy or two for yourself and your friends today. Janice, thanks so much for coming on. Great to see you. Oh, it's nice to see you, too. And just reminded me, I have to have you on my podcast. I hope we can make a date. Oh, I would love to. Anytime, of course. Anything for you, Janice. Uh, your book is fantastic. It was, uh, you know, it's interesting because, you know, your past couple books have been these really inspiring stories of people uh, t- overwhelming, or overcoming, you know, t- difficult odds and, and achieving incredible things. And this book is interesting because it's, it's a little bit different. It, it is, it's more of a, there's a theme of David and Goliath that you have throughout the book. And it really seems like that's kind of the core of, of, of the book. Can you, can you talk about why you decided to go this direction? Well, it goes back to my fight three years ago uh, with the former governor and the fact that he was a machine and people told me he was the Terminator and that he was not going anywhere. But my family had a great tragedy that happened to them. My husband lost both of his parents in separate elder care facilities during the pandemic. Uh, Our disgraced governor put 9,000 COVID positive patients into nursing homes. And that began my fight when I realized uh, that there was something wrong there. It was tragic. It was deadly. uh, And someone had to stand up. And because it happened to my family and I had a platform to do that, I began the advocacy. And now we're three years later and we still don't have answers and we don't have an accountability. He's gone. Um, But that doesn't mean that uh, the tragedy is forgotten. So I began with that story, my story. And from there, I wanted to find others that went up against incredible odds against a person, a machine, uh, an idea, um, uh, you know, lockdowns during the pandemic, um, trying to get our kids back in school, things uh, that we found very challenging and others told us we couldn't do, but we continued to uh, to try our best to raise our voices and find others that were doing the same. And so that's where it came from. And I was able to find incredible stories. Uh, a lot of them come from tragedy. Uh, Unfortunately, you know, one of the stories in there, my friend Ray Pfeiffer, who was a firefighter, fought with uh, my husband, was down at 9-11, of course, and and dug for months at ground zero to find uh, their fellow first responders that had died uh, during the World Trade Center attacks. Um, And he spent his dying days going to D.C. to make sure that his fellow firefighters and first responders got health care that they deserved. So out of that tragedy came goodness because, uh, you know, we he was able to prevail. And those first responders that do have, un- unfortunately, cancer or related illnesses, you know, now will be covered by health care. But it was a battle. It was it went on for over a decade. Um, so, you know, sometimes stories out of tragedy or uh, overcoming incredible odds, you know, there is a light at the end of the tunnel to help others. Yeah, you know, there's a bit of the, uh, you know, parent lifts a car off of their child type of vibes through to a lot of these stories, which is, is yeah. pretty is pretty incredible. And sometimes I think when you have these terrible moments, you have these tragedies that you go uh, down a, a terrible road, you wind up doing things that you never would expect yourself to do. I, I, one of the, you mentioned the, your story, of course, with, with Andrew Cuomo, and, and there's a lot of COVID underlying uh, through a lot of the stories. The Ron Kim story was really fascinating to me. Uh, you know, he, he's a guy that I honestly didn't know much about. I heard him a couple times early on in the COVID situation talking about his story. And like, I got to be honest, I was a bit cynical. I, you know, I, I, I hear New York Democrat and, and you know, my, my eyes start to roll automatically. But he Your wound, spidey senses. Yeah, exactly. He, he wound up being an incredibly important voice. And I don't know if any of the stuff that happened with Cuomo 
would have happened without what he did. Can you, can you tell people a little bit about his story? He's incredible. And, you know, what happened to our families, because his family was affected as well. His his uncle died in a New York nursing home. And so it was personal for him. And it wasn't political, right? I don't even think of him as a New York Democrat. Yeah. He is, he's part of my family now. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he really went up against a Goliath, I mean, he was threatened by Andrew Cuomo. He got a phone call uh, saying, here's what you're going to say, Mr. Kim. Are you an honorable man? Uh, and basically said, Basically, you didn't see that crime, okay, happen. And here's what you need to say. And if you don't, bad things are going to happen to you. That's basically what he told him on the phone. And Ron, in that decision with his wife and, and beautiful family, had to decide, do I stand up against this machine, uh, this dynasty politician, because I know he's wrong and I know he's lying, and it's against my 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 political, uh, you know, career as well. Uh, my career is probably going to be ended by this guy, but it's in that moment that you make that decision of what's right or wrong. And that's exactly what he did. And truly his story is an American hero story. Um, you know, he is an immigrant, his uncle who died in the nursing home, he was the one that sponsored his family from South Korea to come to America, to have that American dream. Uh, and, you know, he's still uh, he's still in politics. He's an assemblyman in Albany. And he and I have been working together uh, to try to make the situation better. I even had lunch with him today. <laughs> you know, he really is truly a, a, such a good friend of mine. And we never talk politics, you know. Uh, it's, it's great. I mean, it's just, you know, you could tell that there's a lot and there's several stories in the book about this particular period. You talk to a couple of uh, Andrew Cuomo's accusers as well um, and go through their stories. And it's just amazing the, the, the group of people that came together to, to hold this guy accountable. It, if it was just one wing, if it was just one group, it was just one person, there's no way this would have happened. But, mm -mm. you know, number one, because Andrew Cuomo was so particularly awful and had done so many terrible things, a lot, and, and people just decided to step up no matter what their connection was, whether they, whether they agreed with each other or not, uh, to, to, to hold this one guy accountable. I mean, it really is an incredible story. And I think with all of the stories in there, if truth is on your side and you believe in your cause, others will stand up, you know, and, and it really does sometimes take one person, but um, if the message is correct and truth is on your side, then you're going to have people that rise up. You know, one of the stories in there is a familiar one, Miracle on Ice, the 1980s hockey game, right? When uh, it was US Team USA against the Soviets, and no one thought Team USA was going to win, right? Um, but I, I talked to the captain, Mike Arruzzioni, uh, who goes back to that time and says, how important that moment was for America, for all Americans to kind of get together and have that feel good story. But he mentioned, he's like, it wasn't me, it was a team of people, you know? And I think that is the same message in all of the stories, whether it's a person going up a big to a big dynasty politician, you have to have other people that have your back. Yeah, I gotta say, I did not remember they only had two weeks to put that team together. Which is I, it's unbelievable, incredible. I mean, one of the most historic teams in American history, and they kind of just threw it together over a couple of weeks. It really, uh, yeah. it really is an amazing story. Um, let me go to another one. Uh, uh, Adam Curry. The story of Adam Curry is amazing. Here's a guy who's just like an MTV j VJ. You, you remember mm -hmm. him from back in the day, introducing songs uh, and videos. And you, you, I mean, he is one of the inventors of podcasting. Like people don't realize how early he was on all of this stuff. And, you know, his story, I thought, had some really interesting lessons. And maybe you could talk about one in particular, the difference between uh, MTV.com and Elvis.com. Oh, beautiful story. Um, you know, he really is a pioneer for many things. The podcasting, obviously. Um, his mind, I mean, he's a brilliant man uh, to know early on how big the Internet was going to be and to know those domain names like MTV.com, Elvis.com, Curry.com, which he still owns, by the way. And, you know, it was basically going, uh, meeting with a bunch of guys 
and saying, I want to, I want to have this domain name and, and then, and you registering and that, and that's all it took. But at the time people didn't realize that. Right. And so he registered MTV.com and said, I'm going to use it because the kids are on this, you know, and, and MTV at the time was like, well, I don't, we have AOL.com and that's all we need right now. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's his story and how MTV, you know, came back at him and said, we're going to sue you. We want our MTV.com back. Um, but because, you know, he's a really kind man, had they just come up to him and said, Adam, listen, can we have our MTV.com back, please? He would have given it to them. But instead, it was lawyers knocking on his door saying, we're going to sue you for it, even though many times. They had said it was fine that he had MD, MTV.com. So the part about Elvis.com is he registered Elvis.com, knowing that someday it was going to be big. And he was he was getting emails from people when we were not on the Internet, but people that still thought Elvis was alive because of Elvis.com. So he said he would get these beautiful emails like, hey, man, I always knew you were alive. Um, but several years later, he did get a message, a phone call from Lisa Marie Presley, Elvis Presley's daughter, who, of course, we uh, we lost a few weeks ago, tragically. Um, and she said, Adam, uh, I'd like Elvis.com. I'll pay you whatever you want. And he said, Lisa Marie, you can have Elvis.com. And he, he just gave it to her. It's a beautiful, amazing story. And I think that sort of translates to if we're nice to each other, if we're kind to each other and ask politely, you'd be amazed at what can happen. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, to put this in the context of the conversation, MTV.com, MTV acted like Andrew Cuomo would act, right? They tried to bully him. They tried to harass him. <laughs> The Andrew Cuomo is awful mug still exists. That oh, it's still appropriate. <laughs> oh, it sure is. Oh, it sure is. That one will oh, never go out of style. Oh, I should put this up here. <laughs> there, <laughs> there you go. There, oh, there you go. <laughs> Got the other side too. Uh, uh, that's fantastic. Hey, uh, let me ask you one more before before you go. Um, you have a kind of running story throughout the book uh, about your son. And he he was in a, a, a um, uh, an incident where he was being bullied a little bit at school. And you kind of take us through the, how that started, how you heard about it, and how it wound up. And I thought it was a really, uh, it was a really good, interesting story for all of us to learn uh, about how we should treat each other and, and, and how, at times, when we're looking out for other people, it makes us more powerful. I'm going to start to cry. You know, I've done a lot of interviews about the book, Stu, and you're the first one to bring up my son. Oh. Um, and that story is so important because... Um, you know, he, we got him into a new school and again, this has to do with COVID and, and schools being closed. Um, the, the Catholic school was open and, um, we, you know, he's still there. It's a wonderful school. He's having a great time, but as a new student, um, you know, he was kind of targeted. Uh, there was one boy that every day would, would really bother him and he would come home crying and saying, mom, you know, I don't know why he's so mean. And we did everything right. I called the teacher, the principal. Um, I, I wanted to do everything in my power without, you know, kind of disrupting the apple cart, right? You don't want to be sure. that one that comes in and starts calling the parents and, and he's brand new to the school. But I, I tried to do it as organically as possible. And he just got kind of used to it, right? And some days it would be worse than others. Some days he would ignore him. Um, and then one day in the, in, basically in the schoolyard at recess, the bully started targeting another boy who happened to be Theodore's good friend. And when Theodore was the target, he just kind of took it, right? And internalized it and would go come home and cry and tell me about it. But when the bully was picking on his buddy, that's when Theodore got the courage to say something like, why do you always do this? Why are you such a bully? Don't bully my friend. Um, you know, go pick on someone else, your own size type of thing. And he told me that he came home and he, he, you could tell he was very proud of himself. And he said, mom, you know, I stuck up for my buddy today. That bully was, was, was being mean to my friend. And I told him that, that, you know, he needs to stop doing that. And I just thought, oh my goodness, you know, what a lesson it, it's one thing to be bullied yourself. Um, but to stand up for a, another person, what a lesson that was. And at the end of the book, uh, I talk about the fact that, 
you know, even though my son and the bully are not necessarily friends, uh, the bully has gotten much better. Um, and I credit my son, you know, I credit my son for, you know, speaking up and, and saying that this is a, this is wrong behavior, um, and, and sticking up for somebody else. I mean, he's 12 years old and he's learned that lesson so early in life. And so that's kind of how I wrap the book up, you know, that we can learn lesson from, from the schoolyard and, and a boy sticking up for his buddy. Mm, that's so cool. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, that, that's how you know you're a good parent right there. When your kid, like what, what my, my son every once in a while sticks up for my daughter and I just like, ah, mm. oh, it's the best moment, I think, as a parent. It really is. Um, yeah. Janice Dean, Fox News senior meteorologist, host of the Janice Dean podcast and author of I Am the Storm, inspiring stories of people who fight against overwhelming odds, which is available now wherever you get your book. Janice, so great to see you and thanks so much for coming back on the show. You're a good human being. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much, too. And thank, thanks for having me on. And I hope you'll come on my podcast as well. I would love to. Anytime, Janice. Thanks so much. Mwah. Well, Gwyneth Paltrow is in court still, and this... <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. The story is just amusing to me, and it's probably it's sad. The guy there was a big uh, ski accident, and Gwyneth Paltrow, I don't know, allegedly ran into this guy and caused some injuries. And uh, I don't know. Gwyneth Paltrow weighs like 18 pounds, so I don't know what she could do to somebody. Uh, but I guess on a ski slope, get a little bit out of control, bumped off course, bang into something, could be bad. He did say something about how his wine tasting parties are now. This is could there be more elitist? They were on ski slope at Deer Valley. And uh, the accident caused the guy to not have good wine tasting parties. So uh, that's a problem. And someone tweeted this. Gwyneth Paltrow looks like she's on trial in 1987 for hiring a hitman to kill her husband. And the, it is a visual joke. I apologize, podcasters. But it looks like it could be it could be the cover of a Netflix. Uh, you're clicking on her face when you're watching the Netflix true crime series. This could be a poster hanging at CrimeCon. That is. <laughs> it is, uh, it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's incredible. I, yeah, look, she's, I, she is, uh, you know, she, we told, talked to you about this yesterday. She uh, tried, what is it called? Uh, rectal ozone therapy. That was one of the things she does. So it's hard to ski with that going on. That's, that's the truth. Uh, Utah governor signs laws requiring parents' consent for minors to use social media. New Utah laws, HB 311, SB 152, require that social media companies verify the age of any Utah resident who makes a social media profile and get parental consent for any minor who wishes to make a profile. This is interesting because I, I feel I, I need to like really sit down and make up my mind on this, I will say, because... It's one of those things that makes me uncomfortable as a person who really doesn't like government involvement in anything. Uh, you know, that's my default. So I really am hesitant. However, I am for, let's say, a law to keep kids out of strip clubs. And I think we could all say, well, why don't parents just keep their kids out of strip clubs? They should. This one's not even banning social media for kids. It's it's uh, just asking to get parental consent, which seems incredibly appropriate considering what is going on. And when I say what is going on, uh, TikTok is going on. Uh, the TikTok CEO thing, it did not go well with the TikTok CEO in front of Congress. Uh, five big takeaways uh, from CNN. They say Washington has already made up its mind about TikTok. And that's like true. It seems like both sides are just like, screw these people. They suck. Um, the TikTok CEO stresses his practices are no different than U.S. tech giants. I think that's supposed to be a defense. But like, what does that tell us about U.S. tech companies? Not, not positive things. TikTok's impact on children was a key point of the focus. It's true. It's, I mean, like, not to mention it's just making the kids more annoying. Um, but uh, also, it's just not good for kids. Um, they, uh, and he went on and on and on. I don't know. Look, again, I don't know if there's actual legal process and a, a way you're going to be able to ban TikTok. They could probably pressure them into selling it eventually, which is going to be hard. But the biggest thing you should take away from the TikTok stuff is TikTok is banned in China. They banned it. They don't let their people on it, but they want your kids to be on it. So thanks for playing ball with them. All right, Blaze TV. You know it. You know what it is. You're on it right now, probably. Maybe you're listening to the podcast. I mean, you're like, I don't want to subscribe to that. I, it, it costs too much money. Well, first of all, we're talking about entertainment for people who love America. 
So no matter what age you are, there's something here for you. You'll get all the news of the day, of course, but you also get much more from opinion to spirituality to observations on world events to outright comedy. There's something here for everybody. All you got to do is pick the plan you love best. And you're thinking, well, I happen to be a person who drives an ambulance. And I think to myself, no, no, I don't have enough money for that. I need to spend my money on ambulance-related activities. And that's okay. But that's also why we have a discount for you. If you are a student, if you are a member of the military, if you are a first responder, you can save 30 bucks on an annual plat pass at blazetv.com slash stew. You just go there and uh, get, uh, get that all connected. Now, Blaze TV is out to win the culture war. That is, of course, very important to our future. All the entertainment and enlightenment you've been missing. Join Blaze TV today. Get 30 bucks off an annual pass student, military, or first responder discount. Go to subscribe.blazetv.com. I think slash do, but anyway, you can just use the verification number and get your ID, uh, enter your IT to get, ID to get started. It's 30 bucks off an annual pass for students, military, and first responders. Subscribe.blazetv.com. Waves in opposition. Anita D is an opponent. Oh, no. Waves in opposition. Uh -oh. Holden his Oh, no. He's also an opponent. All right. <laughs> this happened to a Florida state representative. Uh, obviously, we beeped that, uh, but uh, they were uh, basically jokes about male genitalia uh, and in, worked into names. I need a uh, hold in his uh, negative experience, probably a little bit getting trolled there. And it's good. Hey, I don't know if Alex Stein was present at this particular hearing. I assume he was, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll have to ask him and see if that's true. By the way, also uh, make sure to avoid the asteroid. It's the size of 22 tuna. It's coming to, uh, coming to Earth. It's going to fly closer to the Earth than the moon. And it, the 22 tuna thing is very fascinating. They were saying the other day there was an asteroid the size of a certain amount of camels. I think this is just like what the nerds at NASA are doing now, like to try to draw attention to these stories, just make the, the, the measurement uh, bizarre. Like what? I guess, now I went into this a little bit today. There are many kinds of tuna. They range from like four feet to 10 feet. Which kind of tuna is this? Well, it's the 10 foot kind. They're saying it's 220 feet wide. So just say that you want to get, you want to really, if you don't think people understand it, uh, it's about 70 yards of a football field. Maybe it's a couple school buses. You want to go that way, but really 22 tuna. I just think at this point they're screwing with us. Okay. So here's what happened. We started the show today reminding you of when the media went crazy about Mitt Romney having his dog on his roof like 40 years ago. Well, Katrina Spivey, 23 years old of Springfield, wanted to up the game a little bit. She put her kids on the roof. I, now, can you blame her? You know, we don't know the context of this. She's got uh, three, uh, four, four felonies, a DWI, first degree endangering the welfare of a child, two counts of first degree endangering the welfare of a child. Uh, and she drove through a gas station with the kids on the roof. But just three kids. I mean, the question is, how big was her roof? Was there enough room for these kids? How were they attached? Did, they, did, he, did she duct tape them up there? I mean, I think that would be okay. Uh, by the way, one other piece of advice, and this is important here as we uh, get to, into the weekend. You may, you may be thinking about doing this. I have done it. Have you seen the new TikTok trend? The new TikTok trend, and I care, I don't, of course, not on TikTok, but my wife showed me this, and it is actually incredible. You take a fruit roll up, you put some vanilla ice cream in it, you wrap it up, it instantly becomes frozen. It becomes like a crunchy fruit roll up thing on the outside of ice cream. It's fruit, it's cream together, it's delicious. It's really, really good. Unfortunately, a lot of the people around you are dumb. So, fruit roll ups is telling TikTok users, to not eat the plastic that's attached to the fruit roll-up when they eat the fruit roll-up. This should not need to be said. But here we are in 2023. And you know what? Every person that ate the plastic is going to cancel out your vote in next year's election. Good luck, America!